Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Les Klein, and I'm a principal at BDP Quadrangle, and I'm also chair of the ULI Toronto Governance Committee. I would like to call our evening program to order. It is so wonderful to hear that buzz and to see all of you live and in three dimensions. We hope that the trend towards face-to-face -face events continues. The fireside chats are a signature event of ULI Toronto, and we have in the past been treated to ind industry leaders sharing their insights, their challenges, and their visions. We have a fi f an amazing fireside chat program tonight, again, and we can't wait to get to it. But before we do, I have the great privilege of introducing and turning the podium over to our recently announced incoming chair of ULI Toronto's Management Committee, Michelle Ackerman of the, of the Kilmer Group. I'd like to welcome Michelle up to the podium to formally begin our program this evening. Thank you. I'm a little bit shorter. Thank you, Les. Um, welcome, everyone. I am so pleased and excited to assume this leadership role commencing July 1st in what promises to be a very exciting two-year term, including ULI Toronto hosting the Urban Land Institute's major spring meeting conference in May 2023, <laughs> which, if you're keeping track, is almost a year to the day from now, which will go by very quickly. Uh, during the spring meeting, we will welcome close to 5,000 North American and global real estate leaders to be here in Toronto for this major event as we showcase our city to the world. There's a video. <laughs> There's a video. Please stay tuned for more details, including how your company can play a role in this first ever international ULI conference in Toronto. As a Toronto region-based organization, we acknowledge the land we are meeting on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, 
the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. We are all treaty people. Many of us have come here as settlers, immigrants, and newcomers in this generation or generations past. ULI Toronto stands in solidarity with Indigenous communities demanding action and accountability for the ongoing legacy of the residential school system. We'd also like to acknowledge and honor those who came here involuntarily, particularly descendants from those who were brought here through enslavement. We also want to acknowledge a most serious matter in the world today, the Ukrainian war. Recently, ULI Toronto and several other industry organizations hosted a special webinar to provide our constituencies with information on how we can contribute to the relief effort here in Toronto. ULI Toronto homepage has details we would like to point you to. For this evening, today's event and all other ULI program programming would not be possible without the support of our ULI annual sponsors. I would like to thank all of our sponsors for their support. Now more than ever, ULI Toronto relies on the support of sponsors to put on high quality programs and to drive our mission to shape the future of built environments for transformative impact in communities worldwide. To all of our annual sponsors, we thank you. Before we bring up our panel, I want to acknowledge and thank tonight's event sponsors. Baker Real Estate, our lead event sponsor, Architects Alliance, the Carpenters Union, and Macmillan LLP. Your support. <laughs> your support has allowed us to do something quite incredible once again, and we thank you for your commitment to ULI. It is now my pleasure to introduce a longtime friend and collaborator, Barbara Lawler, CEO from Baker Real Estate, to introduce the panel. Thank you, Michelle. That was wonderful. Good evening, everyone. My name is Barbara Lawler. I'm the CEO of Baker Real Estate, and we're so excited to be the lead sponsor of today's Fireside Chat. Modern Succession, exploring the unique leadership and transition stories of three next generation women daughters of three Toronto private development dynasties, Kenef, Sorbara, and Tridel. When Alexandra reached out to me with the sponsorship opportunity for tonight, I knew immediately that I had to do it for Baker. I joined Pat Baker the week she founded Baker Real Estate, and although Pat and I are not family, it always felt familial, and certainly it fell into the women rising in business that is tonight's theme. For the past 25 years, Baker Real Estate has served the needs of new construction developers in the sales and marketing of master-planned communities, including high-rise condominiums, uh, townhomes, single-family homes, as well as hotel, condominiums, and resort properties. With a growing market share, Baker has sold over 100,000 homes and over and generated over $80 billion in revenue for our developers. We consult on all aspects of a development, including the ideal unit mix, the floor plans, the pricing, the marketing, and we do it all with great joy, ensuring that our developers maximize their returns. We now have offices in Toronto, in Montreal, and in Vancouver. My job this evening is to introduce this year's Fireside Chat panel, but I'm advised that our panel will in turn be introducing themselves, making my job a whole lot easier. But it is my great honor to call up to the stage tonight's special guests. With that, I would like to introduce the following to the stage. Laurie-Anne Beausoleil, our moderator, 
retired PWC partner and corporate board chair and DEI advisor. Anna Maria Kneff, Executive Vice President at Kneff Group. Christina Sorbara, Vice President at Sorbara Group of Companies. And Andrea Del Zotto, Executive Board Member at Tridel Group of Companies and CEO of Concrete Cardinal. Over to you, Laurianne. Ah, thank you. When I got asked to do this, I said yes. I didn't take more than 30 seconds to say yes, to be on the stage with these wonderful, inspirational women. But you know what? We are gonna do something really different tonight. And we did our land acknowledgement, but we're also gonna do another indigenous ritual, and that is bringing the spirits in the room. And you guys, I've never done this before, so work with me if I mess it up. But I thought, what is this whole conversation? We have three exceptional women on this stage today to talk about their leadership, their innovation, and what they're doing for their representative family enterprises. But you don't get here without those that you stand on their shoulders every day. So part of what we're gonna do is we're gonna bring into this room, and I'm gonna start off with Angelo Delzato, who has recently passed. Andrea's father is in this room with us today to celebrate his daughter's accomplishments. Anna Maria, we know Iggy is so proud of his daughter, and we welcome him into this conversation. And then we have Christina, who is so blessed. Her dad is here. Edward, her dad is in this room. <laughs> Whew, now my turn. <laughs> I told them this was gonna put me in tears. <laughs> and now I gotta bring my own dad in, who I've lost, who will be so proud of me being here today. Sorry, I didn't want to do this, but it is so important for us to appreciate those have created us and have allowed us to be here where we are today. So enough of that emotion, ladies. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> I told them this was gonna to be tough for me. Anyways, I'm so excited. So on that note, for all of us in the audience, we don't get to be sitting here without those that came before us, those that opened doors for us, those that fought for us, and here we are, and I'm going to have each one of these wonderful women introduce themselves. And I'm going to start off with Christina to my left and share with this audience a little bit about Christina. Okay, thank you. I'll, ch I'll change the tune. Yes, please. <laughs> I'll change the tune. Uh, I think it was evident the tune when the four of us were late as we were, yes. we were in the washroom chatting. So yes. uh, thank you, thank you, Laurie, and thank you, Andrea, for that, um, for welcoming in, mm -hmm. um, everyone into the room. So I also, first off, want to thank ULI for putting this together. I know for many people, this is probably your first event out, and for choosing to be here with us tonight, uh, we really appreciate it, so thank you very much. Um, it's very important, and even just, just meeting with these women, we created our own sisterhood the last yes, couple months. Yes, we did. No, um, we did. And it's something that I, I think is going to continue. So my name is Christina Sorbara. I'm a third generation family member for the Sorbara Group of Companies. We are a real estate development firm. And this year, we're celebrating 80 years. And it's something we are extremely proud of. And I think one of my goals is to make sure you know, many more generations, I know my own children speak about their children already, which is far off. So it's one of my big goals. Uh, and currently, I'm VP of Corporate Knowledge. It's focused on uh, our strategic oversight group, our people systems, uh, operations, and corporate responsibility. And with that, I have the distinct honor of being the chair of our family's charitable foundation, which means I get to play an active role in the community in which we um, develop and something that's very important to me. So it's a multifamily, multi-generational company and rewarding, demanding, but I think bottom line is you got to have a lot of grit to stay around. 
Uh, and I'm sure that'll come. That'll, that'll come, come out up. loud and clear, yeah. that's for sure. So, so thank you for that, Christina. And remember, this is a G3. How many family enterprises don't get past G2? So I think, you know, congratulations to you and your family for being able to continue the legacy into this next generation. And when we hear Christina, we're going to hear there's a G4 coming up the ranks. And I think congratulations. And to your father, congratulations. How about you, Anna Maria? Uh, so I guess just to riff off of what Christina was saying, thank you all so much uh, for coming and joining us tonight. There are many more people than I, that I know here that I did not expect to be here. So thank you to all of those who came to support me. Unexpectedly, I'm glad you didn't tell me in advance. Uh, and it's just such an, a delight, an honor, a privilege to be here with you. Thank you. And um, I'm really excited to start a friendship with these three ladies on stage. So um, it's great to get to know you through this process. So as Lori said, I do work with our our family's business, it's the Caniff Group of Companies. And similar to Christina, our company has been around for 70 years. We're celebrating 70 years this year. Very sadly, we lost our founder and CEO two years ago, uh, my father. And we're at the second generation level of leadership. I run the company with my sister and my mother. And I am in charge of investments, strategy, corporate development, business development. And I also manage people and the people and culture function. And we have various charitable organizations um, that we have associated with the business. Um, my sister has been running our charitable organization for several years now. Um, and I, at some point, she's going to pass that torch to me. It's a big job. But we take philanthropy and community giving quite seriously as well. Um, in terms of our responsibility. So um, I don't have quite the portfolio Christina has. <laughs> uh, but I, and I only have two kids. I think she has three. So she's definitely, <laughs> she's, got, she's got a lot more, <laughs> much more efficient than I am. But um, with that in mind, I'm looking forward to the discussion. Oh, fantastic. And my dear friend, Andrea. Thank you. So I know you wanted to do this differently. and. I definitely did it differently, my Perfect. intros. <laughs> so, I don't know if I got it right, but I did it differently. Um, so it's been a couple of years, obviously, since we've all you know, been here and in a crowd. And I was a little bit anxious, to be honest. And then I learned something the other day. It said, it's literally impossible to be anxious and grateful at the same time. So I said, I'm going to go with grateful. I'm going to go with gratitude, because I'm just really grateful to be here. And grateful that so many people showed up, like pleasantly surprised. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, uh, you know, Lori said, I want you to say, who's Andrea? And I said, OK, I'm, I probably am telling more than people wanted to know. But I said, uh, that's a good thing, because one of my father's many lessons was be known by your first name, not your last name. So I was like, OK, I'm going to tell them about Andrea. And who am I? And it came easy to me. I said, I'm in a house full of men, three boys, and a husband, and dogs. And I said, I'm just going to give you the stats, because there's a lot of sports in my house. So I'll go with the stats. <laughs> so I was like, I was the youngest of four. I have three children. I entered the 50 Club this year. My Myers-Briggs is ENFP. <laughs> my, anyone who knows the Enneagram, that's kind of new. I'm an eight. My love language is quality time. And then I thought I'd share a little bit from my report cards when I was little. So I was, uh, <laughs> if you really want to know, I was chatterbox, um, creative, a little bit um, of a dreamer and a drifter, but at the same time kind of had the hyper focus where I was always like a student. So that kind of explained to me my adult diagnosis of ADHD and being neurodiverse, which has been like, you know, a learning experience. So, so it explained a lot. and. Um, you know, a lot of people love to ask the question, what keeps you up at night? And I thought I'm going to turn it around and I'm going to say, what gets me up in the morning? And nice. what, you like that? I love okay. it. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, what gets me up in the morning is what our industry is and its community and most importantly, the people and the belonging that happens between those two things. So that's what gets me out of bed. And I'm happy to be here to talk to all of you. Thank you. Oh, fantastic.
And, um, you know, for myself, as I was a blubbering moment there for a moment, but um, what's so fascinating about this opportunity is daughters on the rise. And I want to pause for a moment because we don't very often get to talk about daughters. So in each one of my colleagues' families, their sons, but we're here to talk about the daughters. And I'm hoping that we're going to do this at GAIN, and we won't even say daughters on the rise, we're just going to say children on the rise. That's my dream and that's my vision. So on that note, you don't get to be one of these three women unless you've been on a journey. There's been, you know, forks in the road, some are straight, some are curved. So Christina, tell us, what was your journey like to get to the point where you are today as Christina, really representing the family in this wonderful group? We here all night. Okay. <laughs> we here, here all night. Well, I, you know, I talk a lot in the we. You know, and not just in the eye. And if you can know, I mean, I think I have two rows here of people that yes. have come to support yes. um, from family to friends to family to business partners. And I think for me, the journey growing up in our family, the business, real estate, our family was part of every single conversation. Mm -hmm. um, I can remember some uh, being so young, driving with my father, this people that know him know this the tap on the window, it's oh. <laughs> telling you who owned which building, which partners bought that, which bank they used, what the financing was, what the number, everything from the time we can remember. So really it's, it's, been, it's been part of me, part of my whole family, mm. um, our whole life. So the journey to where I was today, I, I would say I finished high school, I mean I finished high, um, college and I moved to Germany for a year. And when I was there, I was working for BMW and I remember saying, you know, I'm going to go home, not knowing what that even meant. Mm -hmm. And uh, I went back, and that was really the beginning where I felt, you know, supported and connected to our business, you know, after all of that education. Mm -hmm. And actually, you know, there's a man, Peter Cummins, in the room that was one of my big supporters, um, you know, over 20 years ago, helping me get that start. So that journey, it's evolved, and I think it's still evolving. Mm -hmm. um, and, but I think it's the support of the family and, and governance, really, um, of how we shepherd that support through the family and giving equal opportunity to everybody uh -huh. um, in, in that family to be a part in some way. Uh, and so that's really, and it's still evolving. And you know, it's interesting, Christina, to, you know, 80 years, and look at the fact that your family didn't have to be educated on DE&I, inclusive culture, they were already inclusive. You stand up to the plate, and hopefully you hit a home run. I mean, you know, I want, I want to make, I'm sorry, I'm just going to answer this question. It's not even a question, I'm just answering it. Yeah. I mean, really, like... <laughs> If you, the way you bring that up, yes. you're going to practice this. Like, I, my father, my mother, our family, we've been, we're like ahead of the curve on the DEI. Mm -hmm. If, you know, and um, it was never a gender. It was more just support. Wonderful. Uh, you know, and competence and, and impact. And so that's something that, you know, I'm really proud of. And it, it goes on to the generations that are, that are still coming. Mm -hmm. So... Yes. As you should be. And congratulations. I can't help but not also look at yeah. your dad and say congratulations. Anna Maria, your journey was different. It started off in New York, and then you ended up back in Canada. Tell us how your journey and how you got yourself to the position, or not got yourself, how your journey got you to where you are as part of the family enterprise. So my journey was different in the sense that I grew up, similar to Christina, sort of strapped in the back seat of our car, no car seats. <laughs> uh, I, think, I think my mom was telling me as an aside that we were, you know, schlepped around in wicker baskets when we were babies. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, um, you know, involuntarily taken to commercial sites, residential sites, construction sites, golf courses. Um, so, and, you know, I was, I think I was, I was paid $4.45 an hour to work the 6 a.m. to 2 p.m. shift from the time I was 12, which I'm pretty sure is still illegal, <laughs> until I was 18 at one of our golf courses cleaning. So, you know, my father not so subtly tried to hit me over the head with the fact that I was going to end up at our company. And I, being the independent, stubborn person that I am, wanted to prove, not necessarily wanted to prove him wrong, but I wanted to 
carve out my own path. So what I did was I decided to follow my passion at the time of wanting to go and working in international development aid. So I decided that I was going to go and get an education, go get a PhD, go to, to emerging markets, developing countries, and help to come up with aid programs for people there. So lo and behold, um, my journey took me to investment banking somehow who, uh, <laughs> with one of my first internships where they sold me on the idea I could go work in emerging markets but in an investment banking setting in, on Wall Street. So I thought, perfect, best of both worlds. So I ended up biting, I caught the finance bug and ended up staying in finance for the better part of 10 years. And once I finished the formal part of my education, I continued to work in finance. I loved working on the investment side. And my journey actually took me back home because I wanted to spend time with my grandmother who was starting to develop dementia at the time and actually selfishly be around my nuclear family. We're immigrant, my parents were immigrants, so we had a small nuclear family. And it's only as a result of working in Toronto at investment firms and spending time with my dad, you know, my mom around the business again that I caught the working for my dad bug. <laughs> uh, and so it was not the path that I expected. I had always thought maybe at some point that might be something I might do. I mean, my dad had us talking about interest rates from the time I was 11 at the dinner table. So, you know, it's not something that he was very good at subtly doing, sort of the indoctrination. But I, I ended up working with my father because I wanted to work with my father and not because I wanted to work necessarily at our family company. That was the experience I sought in my mother too, who's, who's at our business. So that was my, I guess, somewhat circuitous journey. Yeah, but uh, here you are, part here of the family enterprise, leading, growing, and developing, which I think is fantastic. Mm -hmm. And Andrea, now this is what I love about this panel. Everyone has a different story. And Andrea, share us your story to where you are today and that journey with sure. Angelo by your side. Sure. Well, they look familiar because we were all on the roads within the back seat of, with our dads driving yeah, us around clearly. the city, waving at each other, I, obviously. And I think we all got this, eh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I didn't realize that was a thing until today. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, the funny thing is when we discovered that, none of us, like, we weren't encouraged to work on construction sites. We were noticing yeah. that our fathers, but we did do <laughs> landscaping and, you know, a few things like that that allowed us to get dirty. Um, but growing up, really, there was not any pressure, no expectation for us to work in the family business. It was always by choice. I, I'll be completely honest, and I, I'd be lying if I didn't say there was a, probably a bit more encouragement for brothers. I was, you know, two boys, two girls, and I think the brothers were maybe a little more steered in that direction, um, although none of them ended up being in the family business. And I really just, you know, dabbled around, did some part-time transitioned to a full-time role, did a couple of other jobs, and then came back. And, and I really, I think the navigation, you know, sadly was still set to the pink ghetto, as they call it. Now, some people haven't heard of that, so I explained it. It's like, it's the path that most women are kind of put on that it's not really the path that gets you to the CEO position. It's like the marketing, the communications, the design. And so, you know, the HR side, the culture side, and, you know, Yes, it was the pink ghetto, but it was also the part that I loved because it was about the people. And, you know, people in the industry, they might refer to us as the big red machine, right? And my argument is always, somebody's running the machine. <laughs> it's not the machine that runs by itself, so it's the people. And that was the part I really fell in love with. And I would say the, after, you know, I think four years ago, my father had to put me on the board of directors and he passed away uh, like almost two years ago now. So that was an intention he had before he passed away that he was very grateful to see, you know, um, lived out. And, and that was kind of an area that I fell in love with, the governance side, because I think they were still, you know, these four gentlemen as the owners that still looked at themselves as a very small family business and not knowing how large they have gotten and everything that was really intuitive or informal, I said, that's really kind of critical to get out of your heads and, and put some policy and practice around. So that was a part that I fell in love with. And, um, 
And then I really, so on the board for four years, and then I decided to do something on my own, which satisfied my own kind of entrepreneurial spirit, as we said, and took something off kind of what I was doing on the side of my desk and put it to the front of my desk, but still involved at the board level and, you know, find it very fulfilling, to be quite honest. So, yeah, it's responsibility. It's, it's an interesting dynamic, needless to say, the only woman and, you know, generational gap and there's, you know, and there's uh, it's also interesting dynamic because as coming from this generation um, we did have the practice of having alternates on our board which you know I was my father's alternate so I would absorb all of that knowledge and he would pass that on and so my alternate is the first time that we are there's a non-family member in the boardroom and so you know takes a level of acceptance and trust to get there but it's possible and I think it's it's an extremely healthy dynamic. So I'm grateful to be the one to bring that in and show that it can be done successfully. Yeah, and it's just, it's, you know, different is good. Different it good. It takes the blinders off and you have very different perspective, which just makes you stronger. Which is fantastic. I mean, when you think about each one of you, the story is similar with the, <laughs> the back seat of the car, the tap on the door, learning the business from your fathers. And yet you've all taken a different journey, which is fantastic. But what I really want this audience to remember is they actually ended at the top of their game. And they got to do that as themselves, adding that next level of leadership. And what I'm going to say to everybody, which is not that easy, but a competency and with innovation and creativity. So now we've got our three panelists sharing how they got to where they are now, what's most interesting, how do you sustain it? When you hear 80 years, 70 years, those are, that's a lot of years. That's a bit of pressure for you three individuals, whether you're doing governance, you're, you're leading from the corporate knowledge, institutional knowledge, the family, you've got strategy. So how are you going to ensure that that organization continues in the legacy of your grandfather, your father, and your respective fathers to continue. So Christina, in your role, and I know you've got surrounded yourself with a dynamo team, how do you sustain that? Well, in the one word, as you're speaking, it comes to mind is team. Uh, and you know, understanding the importance of team. And one of the you know, most positive attributes of our family and our business is that we include everyone. Um, whether it's your family, whether if you're a non-working family member, whether you're, you know, working at the business as an employee, everyone's involved in, in getting us to the next phase. And I think that is key. For us, it's been working because everyone is up on the knowledge. You, you know what's going on and you can help with the transition. And, you know, for me personally, staying, it's not working in a family business when you're part of a family. It's not for everyone. Yep. I mean, you can, can you imagine waking up in the morning and like dealing with your family, then going to work, dealing with your family, then going home, <laughs> dealing with your family, then going out to speak on a panel and dealing with your family. <laughs> and then, like, I mean, not Sounds stressful. Right? But, but it, 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 and that's why some family members, you know, are there, yeah. but they're, they're at a, an arm's length in a, in a different capacity. And, and, you know, there's a lot of blurred lines. So when you say, how do you sustain it to the next generation? For me, one of my biggest goals is to make sure we pass on that information information to those family members that are at an arm's length so they know the importance. We all have that responsibility in us and you know my father and his father, my uncles have put it instilled in us this mm -hmm. family bond and so how do we, what is our piece to play to uh, carry that forward? I think it goes back to team communication and really you, you check your ego at the door. Uh, I've done that you know if I'm playing a sport, no, I bring my ego right yeah. out, and I'm right there, right? But if I'm, when I'm with my family, you have to check your ego at the door and celebrate. I mean, I have some incredible family members. Yeah, you do. And I celebrate all of them, whether they're at, they, I mean, there's none, there's one that's there now, um, but you have to, because they are imperative for us to get to the fifth generation, sixth generation. So that's, I think it's, it goes back team. And, and in that team, though, you shared with us something that I thought was unique, just because you have the family last name doesn't mean you get to enter. Mm. There's a process. I think the audience should understand that process because you do really have to contribute. It's not a hall pass. Mm, right. 
And I, I thought that was so unique, and I think that's a sustainable G3 going to G4. Right. They, you, you know, people think, oh, it's your last name. That's yes. why you work there. Exactly. And again, I go back to family in the morning, family at work, family at night. <laughs> like, you don't, you, it might get you in the door when you're 18 to go work you yeah. know, on the construction site or do the lawn mowing, but it's not, that's not going to keep you there. And then yeah. once you, you have a competence level of something you, where you, what you're working on, say me, I, I want to have an impact on our, um, you know, on our employees, on our people, like Andrea said. You, your name might get you in the door, mm -hmm. right? It's like my father always said to me, your college degree, it's going to open a door, but if you can't do anything on the other side of that door, mm -hmm. they're not going to keep you there. Yes. Um, and so with your family, I think you're always battling that, and you have to constantly reevaluate where you're having your impact. Mm -hmm. And so the, um, and, and that can be having a team this is like the advice I give to myself every day and I give to other people. Have, have an internal team, external team, those that champion you to help you uh, make decisions, where that support is. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have some champions here from um, our company that mm -hmm. have been with us, you know, over 30 years. So, you know, making sure and constantly reevaluating. And you know what? I think that's fantastic. I mean, to have a team that one you could lead, and at times you support, and guess what, sometimes they lead, and sometimes you support. Exactly. Being able to create that, I mean, I congratulate you, Christina. Christina, <laughs> Christina. <laughs> I get that out, Lori. I think that's fantastic. Now, Anna Maria, now what's your kind of dynamic on sustaining what Iggy has started and what you're, you and your mother and a sister are trying to drive forward? Uh, it's, it's a great question because <clears throat> I was, I think the word sustaining is interesting because to me, I don't know that it's so much about sustaining, but I think it's more about trying to reinvent in a way that pays tribute, tribute to the legacy of the company, the name, what my father built. Um, I think it's really easy for family run companies to sit back and have people sit on their laurels and ride off the reputation of what has come before. And I think that there's a reason why 95% of companies at the third generation level fail. Mm -hmm. Because probably, you know, for a bunch of reasons, I, family, working, living, <laughs> family all the time, family all the time is one of those. But um, I think it's important to constantly reevaluate, to your point, you said, use the word reevaluate, ideas. And, and challenge each other and push each other and be surrounded by really smart people that push you. And, and to not take for granted that what built the company and the values, or sorry, the things that made the company successful 30, 40, 50 years ago are what's gonna make the company successful. There's a great book that speaks to this specifically about management style. What got you here is not gonna get you there. I, I might have gotten the title wrong, but you can catch yeah. the drift. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I, I just think it's so important to Take a step back and reevaluate all of our assumptions, at least from our end. Reevaluate your assumptions and, and make sure that those assumptions and those ideas are constantly tested so that it's the best idea in the room that carries the weight mm. and not the loudest voice or the person with the last name. Mm. So that's what um, I think in terms of allowing us to be sustainable going forward. Well, I think that's fantastic. So a lot of team, a lot of openness, mm -hmm. and allowing not just the family, but others to walk through the door and be there with you side by side. And then, Andrea, I think in your introduction, you talked about your governance model. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you're there with your, you know, I, the three founders who are maybe in their 80s, 90s. Mm -hmm. And then there's yourself with innovation, creativity, but the criticality that the family saw of you being there, representing not just Angelo's family, but more importantly, being that next generation. You're that G2 person that's governing and leading and ensuring that everybody underneath is doing the right things. That must be tough. So it's heavy lifting. <laughs> it's, I was going to say, so help us understand, because, you know, everyone talks about governance. It's governance, but you're living it, and you're driving it. Share with us, how does, what does that look like? And for those that want to learn, what, give right. us a little tidbit of what we can take away from this conversation. Yeah, I think um, 
the formality of practices that may not be expressed but just implied is critical. I think the openness and inclusiveness of you know outside people that we've that we've implemented, um, and also process like when when you talk about the last name, you know that's the green light to get. I took something that um, in terms of the innovation side that. You know, it's like we could have tried to make, you know, some of the things that I'm doing outside the business now happen inside, but would it be what's best for the business and would it be what's best for me, right? Because if you think of, you know, some of the the underlying concepts of innovation or if you take it, if you take it and bring it somewhere there that it's not really used to, it's like a foreign substance. It's like a virus and the antibodies of the organization are going to attack it. And that's really not the place to do it because... You, know, you can you can take a bulb and plant it and you, you bring it in a beautiful environment, but if nobody's going to water it or grow it or there's no sunlight, it's going to die. So mm -hmm. it's not always the best place. So so don't try to make things fit that don't necessarily fit and find a way to make it work that's maybe a little bit different and creative. And uh, I would, you know, some of the lessons I would say that I've learned from my father are, are also helpful moving forward. Like, um, you know, I would say he had something I'd describe as intellectual humility. He didn't have to be the smartest guy in the room. He didn't have to be the loudest voice, like you said, right? Someone else could be. And then also, also just you know, allowing people to be themselves and not looking for perfect. So he didn't, have, he didn't have the criteria of what would fit the role. It was the best person, right? It didn't have to be, um, you know, sometimes you, you look at a bit of a flawed criteria and as to who progresses and who fits a certain title as they escalate and they attain leadership in the organization. You know, look at, look at who's the best person regardless and who's got that intellectual capital, as they say. So he did that and he taught me that. And uh, the other thing was, you know, talk about huge shoes to fill. I, I will never be my father. And there's a time I realized that's okay because I'm not him. And the world is not the world he grew, he grew up in sure. and built the business in. It's a very different place. And you look at all the aspects of building, and it's not at all as simple as it was. It's much more complex, and not everything is maybe going to be feasible from within. Um, so when he didn't look for perfect, I would say, you know, having big shoes to fill, even he always put people first, right? And that's critical. And even with me, with big shoes to fill, I'd be like, imposter syndrome, right? And he'd say, you know... <laughs> When you're using your own unique talents to do something, you're absolutely not an imposter. You know, just you're, you're yourself, and that's the best you can be. So all of those kind of philosophies, the foundational pieces to the culture you want to build, the policies, the practices, I think, you know, and the governance. Um, and it's, you know, like I said, heavy lifting. It's 80 years of changing the way things have, done, have been done is is painful at times so yeah it takes grit like you said at the beginning and uh, it takes a lot of cooperation and i'd say the beauty of our board is there's a reciprocated listening and learning so i'm not the i'm not at the kids table at the board table <laughs> i'm actually at the adults table now and um, they listen and yeah. it's like you know it's it's just it's an incredible dynamic to see because sometimes you don't think they will because they're a little bit stuck in their ways sometimes, um, but but they are they are open and they listen and and that's you know you couldn't ask for something better. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, you know it's fascinating. There's one theme that I've heard from these three ladies is all of their leaders had one thing in common: you don't get to succeed if you don't have people. And the beautiful part, each one of you told a different story in your own different way, but that's the foundation of success is people. Mm -hmm. Whether they carry your last name, whether they're your family member or they're not. If you've got that right group of people managing and governing, it does require and it does lead you into success. Mm -hmm. But let's be honest, ladies, you guys are all in a male-dominated industry, so, you know, that's working in the family. But... You know, how was it, you know, as you got to these roles, you walk into these meetings with vendors, stakeholders, and others, did you find yourself having to prove yourself, or was it you were accepted and the meetings 
continued as they should. So I'm going to start off with Anna Maria, and then I'm going to move over into a little slightly different question for others. But from your perspective, Anna Maria, you took over, you're in the meetings. Share with, the, in the, the, yeah, share with us what did that feel like? Was it any different from what you experienced internally versus externally? Yeah, so when I first joined the company uh, 11 years ago, my father thought it was important that I had PNL experience. So he put me in charge of our smallest division at the time, the one that really I couldn't mess up. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So he, he wanted to make sure that I had an opportunity to cycle through different parts of the business. Um, and I knew going in that there was going to be a lot of concern, distrust, uncertainty about whether I was capable, whether I was interested in working in the family business, whether I had been fired, whether you know I was going to be there for six months and leave. So I, I was very... Con I, I was very self-aware about how I was entering, because I was entering in a leadership position. And I was also very self-aware that a lot of the people that I was going to be working with had been at our company for decades. So I approached it like I had approached every other job, which was I was just going to work my butt off to make sure that I was engaging, that I listened to people's perspective, that I was really you know, a team player, that I would learn from from these people because they had a lot to share. So I really went in with so much determination um, and grit to try to do my best to make sure that I earned the trust of the people that I was working with. Because essentially, they had seen me grow up and I was parachuted in to be their boss. So, you know, I was, um, I, I was nervous, but I also knew that um, if I, was inclusive, engaging, respectful, listened, a good listener, and, and did my best to lead that it would, it would turn out well. And it did, it did that, that early start did turn out quite well. Um, I had a couple of early wins that were really helpful. Um, just as, I guess, I'll anecdotally share that there was this one little site that we were working on that had been a gas station that hadn't been meeting its average daily volumes, its quota for, for selling gas. And the team in place had hired external consultants to help us see what we could do with this little site. And um, I just decided I would see what I could discover, how maybe we could do something different with the site. So I did a little bit of digging around. I got another planning opinion. You know, I read the documents myself. It took me forever. Uh, and we managed <laughs> to turn it around, and now it's this little 4,060 square foot national bank. So, you know, that was a, a win for, for the team because we managed to turn something around and I, I tried very hard to make sure it was an inclusive exercise. It wasn't just me coming in and telling them to go and figure out how we could change the use of this little eyesore. Um, so it, it took a lot of hard work and, um, I mean, I wasn't concerned about it being male dominated because my entire career I've spent working in, in male-dominated industries and finance and investment funds and hedge funds and investment banking and private equity. So that, to me, was the easy part. Um, so that was how I sought to, as um, gracefully as possible, enter the business uh, and hopefully earn the respect of the people that I was working with. I think that's fantastic. You presented your genuine, authentic self with a great team. And you've created an innovative team that changed a gas station into a bank and created, I'm sure, a ton of money. <laughs> <laughs> now, Christina, you're, you're so philanthropic. So now, I mean, the Sobrero Group builds communities. But you've taken that concept of community to the next level. You realize that you've got to give back sometimes to get to where you are. Like, I mean, I think you're philanthropic leadership, but also how you're in great, you brought that into the day-to-day -day business is unique. And I think that's what has set you apart and why you're sitting on the panel today. Share with us a little bit of that kind of, I'm going to say, different approach, because philanthropy isn't necessarily always goes hand-in-hand -hand with 
driving the P and L yeah. and driving the top and the bottom line. Right. Um, for sure, I can go on a big spiel of all the organizations that we support as a big promo for them. Um, but if starting from my grandfather, mm -hmm. right, he, you know, we were told he had a stroke when I was 13. Mm -hmm. So I never was an adult or old enough to learn his wisdom, right? All the wisdom that I've gathered from him would be from my father, from my uncles, mm -hmm. from my aunt, um, even so far and, you know, employees that have worked with him, even so far as I had a book written from his first girlfriend when he was 19, <laughs> so I could understand him at 19. Wow. Right? Yeah, I really tried to uh, understand who he was. But one wow. of the things he wow. imparted uh, to his children that they lived out was that, you know, fortune and wealth were yes. things that they were blessed with and, you know, to pass on to others. And this has been, you know, we worked as like the mission that, you know, I live by every day in, in thinking about um, our philanthropic activities. Mm -hmm. okay? And um, again, growing up, it was if we did an event or if we went to a dinner, there was always a charitable aspect. I mean, I have hockey sticks. My father would buy me from you know, Yarmir Yager on my wall. He's, you know, we do silent auctions. We go to events. We climb the CN Tower. There's always something that we did and we just knew you don't just go, you also give back to the community. Uh, and so moving forward, how do you impact that amongst the employees? And actually just the last couple of years, we um, implemented this software and I'm waiting for it to kick off. Um, we are pretty good at about 60%, but it's a software in our, for our employees to vote every month uh, in the communities in which we build. So every wow. month they get a say on you know, which developments and which organization they want to support. And it's just a way, you know, we um, trying to you know, listen to the employees' voices and something that they wanted to be a part of um, and try to uh, implement it. And, yeah. you know, hopefully it continues on. But I wanted to touch back on a point when we were talking here. I think one of the themes I also hear is the time that all of our, you know, fathers or families, these founders, these, and there are these men, in your case, even your mother, have grown these huge businesses, okay? And one thing that is really, really stuck, you know, as I listen to other people, I listen to you guys, is the time we get, FaceTime, mm. right? If I have, you know, and I try and do that with my own kids, if I have a crazy idea, my dad always picks up the phone. It's like, I can only imagine. I remember being a kid, he's always there. You could call, you have this crazy idea, he'll, you know, he might say no, but it was always a crazy idea. Now knowing how much goes on in a day, just that fact alone, that support enough to say, okay, it might be crazy, but you know, it's, it was listened to. So you feel good, right? You're yes. like, oh, okay, it's a neat idea. It's not that I have no one to, to share that with. Uh, and the other uh, big point is we were talking about relationships and people and how our businesses are about people. Another mm -hmm. point we've been ingrained yes. in our head since we were young, the negotiation and people. You need to understand both of those. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling you, there's not a day that goes by. If I'm at a building, I'm at, you know, I can be at a little restaurant or something and they know our business and they have some story about one of my father, my uncles, my aunt, my grandfather. So much so today, I'm at a little car dealership. I called him. Yeah. And this man remembers him at 23 years old. You know? Yeah. That is, yeah. you know, you say what continues a family, a yes. business to move. It's, it's, that, it's respect. It's giving everyone that time, no matter what. Mm. And that, you, you're going to be remembered for that. You're not going to be remembered if you go in like a bulldog and make a deal. You, can, you know, you're, you're never going to be remembered for that. So it's something that I, you know, hold very true. And that, that's going to help us you know, moving down the road. Absolutely. And I think you guys are going to have a lineup outside of people that want to join. Because, <laughs> yeah. I mean, both, it's just so exciting and so creative. But I'll go I, if someone has leaf tickets. I have a pair. But anyways, <laughs> Andrea, now you've done something a little unique. And I know we're running out of time and I want to get to the Q&A. But you've started your own business. Mm -hmm. So you are part of the board. You're, you're running the family um, office. You've got your board position. But you're doing something a little unique. And I think this is also important for the audience to hear. 
it's okay sometimes to try something a little different on your own. I mean, that takes tenacity yeah. and confidence. So maybe you could just share with us as we're wrapping up um, a yeah. little bit about that. And we're going to do one, uh, gosh, I'm going to get it with that sign soon. But oh, uh, um, if you could, because I think this is important. Sure, yeah. I would just, you know, I would invite people to think about the various ways that you can participate in a family business. There's lots of people that feel trapped in a family business. Yes. Um, there's a lot of, you know, it creates a lot of challenges, like people struggle with their self-worth. You know, what part of me is valuable because I'm with the business? What part is valuable because it's me? Um, you know, people like to play a game. Which character from the Succession series are you? Yeah. you know, I'm, sure, I'm, sure, I'm sure we're all Siobhan. I love that that's series, like by the, the way. Um, <laughs> and it's just, you know, I don't know where it's going with that, but yeah, the FaceTime, you know, what I guess, you know, yeah, one of the yeah. one of the things I miss about doing something on my own is that FaceTime I would have with my dad. And you're right, you'd never realize just exactly what goes on and the extent mm -hmm. of their day-to-day, -day, but you got to see it firsthand. And uh, you know, but growing up, like another lesson to anybody who's like workaholic, I I never felt it because one of the things one of the very clever things my dad did. My mom said, I never saw your father in the 70s. Like, he was building a business. I'm like, really? Because I thought he was around all the time. Like, he would, you know, drive me to school in the morning. And if he had a late night meeting, it was after dinner. It, he would never miss dinner. Like, there was always family dinner. And that's just, like, those are the things that I miss, like, on a day-to-day -day basis. But, um, you know, he would... Even when I was doing it on the side of my desk, he was very supportive. So there's many paths to staying involved in a family business. And um, you have to think, I guess, what it, you know, people are part of the, the legacy piece. You know, people would ask me, would you, ever, would you ever leave? It's a legacy. And my father would always say, you can create your own legacy um, and be an extension of this. And that and just kind of you know, gave me the freedom to, to experiment and do things that I would find very rewarding. So, you know, he knew about that, my endeavors before he passed away and very supportive. And I think, you know, what I loved most about real estate and buildings and communities was that, you know, I studied sociology, was that people part. So, you know, our tagline for our business is innovating the invisible because we all know there's so many issues in Toronto. Um, affordability being one of them, but just the definition of community and how we can give people, it's foc our business is focused on giving people that are underrepresented or don't have loud voices, kind of, you know, amplify their voices and give them more opportunities. For example, you know, an invest, a lot of venture capital not investing in black professionals, so we've made our first investment in that. And it just, it feels really good. And, you know, to do the things in certain communities where there needs to be support, there isn't a lot of support. Um, so it's just, you know, there's women's communities. There's, there's a lot that we're, um, we're about to kind of put out there. I don't want to let the cat out of the bag, but it's, it's exciting and rewarding, and I just feel like it's a smart building. A smart building's not going to work unless you've got kind of smart people in it that know how to run it, and I feel like communities don't work unless you've got really healthy, you know, fulfilled people living in those communities. So how can we create better, because I think it's the, it's the communities that fail the people. I don't think it's the people that fail the communities. I think some of the social constructs and systems need to just be re-looked at, and part of what we do is integrating those in what we built. So I'm just like on the softer side of that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, fantastic. And I've been getting the sign. I've got so Sorry, many... sorry, Simon. No, no, sorry. no, no, it's not you. It's, <laughs> it's uh, the facilitator, the moderator. But you know what? I think all of you that are sitting in this audience have had one heck of an opportunity to be exposed to these dynamic, innovative, creative leaders. And I'm, I know their daughters on the rise is the theme, but I want to take out the word daughters. These are leaders on the rise. And I want to suggest, ULI, we're happy to come back in 10 years because I think we're going to have one hell of a story to share with all of you. I am pumped and excited to have been part of this. Um, it was emotional at the beginning, and I have to tell you, I think the fathers were in the room because I was like, <laughs> which uh, anybody from PwC would be shocked that Lori even cries. But uh, <laughs> on that note, I just want to say thank you, and we want to open it up to the Q&A. I've had the opportunity to have the great conversation, but let's 
get the audience to ask some great questions of this fantastic panel. Ah, oh, so I'm not sure, do we have a mic? So we've got some questions in the front. Got, is it Laura? And, Laura. yep. And then the gentleman, yep. Hello, thank you. Hmm. Can you hear me? Yes, uh, I'm not sure. I, we can. <laughs> you are all so impressive. As senior leaders, could you please share your best piece of advice, not that you got to your father, yeah. on how to keep your employees engaged and happy within your organization? Christina, why don't you give that one a, a shot? I'll do it. Oh, you <laughs> okay, Andrew, <and> then. <laughs> this was not from my father, but I, when I read it, I felt my father saying it to me because it's what I lived. It's, it's a quote by Freud, and it was, how brave one can be when they know they are loved. And I think that can be a child, that can be an employee. And the stories of my father saying, you know, used to go to construction sites and people would say, what are we going to try that's new today? right? That's engagement, right? Like that's just, you know, just challenging the status quo. And I thought the psychological safety, people feeling they are safe, safe and cared about is what is going to keep people engaged. Mm -hmm. I think it has a lot to do with it. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Sorry. No, 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 I think, I think that's, that, that's, that's important. And in, in the core of our business, say, you, you know, we have a lot of fringe businesses that aren't maybe in our head office. And I think at the core, it is that knowing that maybe they're, you know, they're loved. You know, we have a lot of employees that have been with us over 25 years. I mean, we had an awards last year and we had three at 45 years. Mm, wow. You know, you don't know who stays anywhere more than five years now, you know? Uh, and so knowing that is that we create for us, you know, we, like you said about your dad, don't know how big it's gotten. Um, we create a family environment. Are there things that we can, opportunities that we have to change? Yes, and I think in time, like anything, it will, you have to make changes to get up with the times, like when you had computers. I mean, we still have a typewriter in our office, okay? <laughs> I will okay. say though, we also so, had 45 so, year employees and that, that it, like, it becomes a family. You, and it's like, the, I, I, you know, the Jeannie Bus from the Lakers, right, the owner, she said, my dad had, her, had his children, but his baby was the Lakers. It's like, it came at a cost. Like, mm -hmm. every employee at Tridel were his family, right. also. So we have some other questions. Okay. I just, uh, maybe, where's my phone? Perfect, and then I, I do saw the no. gentleman. Yep, I saw I'll, you. I'll pass it on next. Richard yes. Joy from uh, ULI Toronto. Um, thank you. First of all, I want to quickly acknowledge, uh, this was a great idea. Danielle uh, Feeler from Tridel had the idea yes. to do this panel uh, back in the fall, and, and it's worked out, I think, pretty well. Um, and also, that, that we weren't going to do this panel without you, Lorianne, so, so you've done an amazing you. job. <laughs> okay, tough question. You may not be expecting it, but we're in the middle of a provincial election. I'm not asking anybody to get political. <laughs> but I am, I, if you had what we are doing, ULI, shameless plug, we have an event next, a webinar next week, next Thursday, week tomorrow, um, which has a candidate from each of the, uh, of the uh, political parties, the provincial parties, attending. We're going to ask them a bunch of questions. If you had to ask a question of the candidates, not any one particular party, but of the candidates that relates to our industry, what question might you pose to them that we might, in turn, pose to them? <laughs> well, so, uh, you know, daughter's on the rise, now we're going political, but um, <laughs> I, 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 maybe we could just quickly, maybe Anna Maria? Sure, I mean, gosh, there's like 20 questions I would ask. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's really important to ask them how they would hold themselves accountable to all of the pre all of the ink that has been spilled on the topic of affordability. I mean, everybody just throws the word around as though you know it, it, it is a problem and it's something that's easy to write about. It's populist, but I would ask for very, very, very specific strategies that they would have in working with the federal government to talk about affordability. Fantastic. Thank you, Anna Maria. We had a question for the gentleman. A, a comment and a question. First of all, uh, the fact that as young children, um, your parents put you in baskets in the backseat. <laughs> for my generation in our old media, I probably don't need that. Moira will tell you that. <laughs> yeah. uh, from, from my generation, I was yelled at, get out of the back window. I can't see <laughs> <laughs> um, 
you know, whenever you come to any of these things, you, you always say, come away with one thing, one thought. And yes. I've got so many. It's, oh, fantastic. It's amazing. And I've been to a lot. Um, my question is, you're with such traditional, historic companies with such huge reputations. Are there challenges in ever overcoming, but we always do it this way? Mm. Does that ever come up, or how do you handle that? Or um, just like, because we deal with that a lot in our own lives. Oh, we've always done this way. You tell your kids yeah. that. That's how we do it. So I just, I'm interested, because as you bring your companies forward into a whole new world, um, how, do you, how do you deal with that? You know what? That's a fantastic question. I'm going to, Christina. Yeah. Uh, I love that question. Mr. Cummins, um, I think that uh, one of the things that's been successful for us is understanding it's a long runway. Change, who likes change? No one likes change. You, like you, I, I use almond milk in my instant coffee every morning, right? You put regular milk, it's like, no way, I, I can't have it. Um, it's, it. No one likes change. And so if you come in, one of the things I see in my generation Right? We are on the internet, we're Googling everything, we're reading everything, we always have the next best idea. I have a brother that, he's a musician, he's gonna solve the health, he's a doctor now. Yeah, he comes in, he knows how to do everything. And then, so imagine you have family members or employees that you are going to think, oh, I have the best computer program, I want, you know, I was talking to someone about prop tech here tonight, like, this program is gonna solve your development issues, this is going to solve your, if you, we always come up with these ideas without even understanding how, hard it is to actually implement them inside of an organization that's been around, like for us, that still has a typewriter. So you, I, I think um, one of the things that's been successful for us is knowing we try, you know, you always try and infiltrate, you bring it up, you bring it up, but it's, it's, it has to be a long, uh, a long outlook. You know, some things happen right away, but, you know, changing um, big, big impact things, especially, um, technology um, takes a long time. Um, and I'm just happy that we, in our organization, we don't have a, we are a very inclusive organization. And I think that we really try hard on the people side. And we have a lot to, more to do, but I, I, you know, I'd rather be ahead in that and then lag uh, on the other parts, so. I would have add one more thing to that. Um, because I do encounter that, this is how we've always done it. And it's really not broken, so why? Right? We're, we're, we have the fortune of still being in a great industry, right? Where it is not broken on our end. And I, you know, one of the one of the kind of tricks up my sleeve is <laughs> if it's if it's, it's sometimes it depends who says it. And I, you know, I, I'm I'm all for passing an, uh, something new on to come through someone else's mouth if it's better received. So if there's no ego attached to the idea sometimes, sometimes that helps. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. And persistence. Yeah. I was going to say, I think the Churchill quote is, I think right before the start of Battle of Britain, that could be wrong. He said, never, 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 never give up. And I feel like yeah. when sometimes we're trying to introduce new initiatives or technology, uh, I think that patience is very, very, very important and really coming up with a great reason for it. Like, it can't just be that it's a great idea. There has to be a business case for it mm -hmm. and it has to be justifiable. If there's evidence to back it up and the resistance is still, well, Mr. Canop didn't do it that way. Well, you know, one well, of the- I'm not Mr. Canop. Yeah, exactly. We are. <laughs> <laughs> one, of the, one of the things that I say is, well, why don't we just try it and see what happens? The worst that can happen if, if all of our data is wrong and all of our ideas are wrong is that we, we tried something that didn't work. So mm -hmm. uh, I think that evidence-based as much as possible or business, business case basing type of approach uh, can be helpful. Um, but it's something that, it's a great question. It's something that we encounter very often. <laughs> yeah. So are there any other questions that I miss any hands before I do the close? Oh, one hand over here. So I don't. I don't, oh, there, the mic is. 
Thank yes. you for sharing so openly and graciously. We have a lot of women in the audience and you've each shared that you're mothers uh, and we're just on the heels of uh, Mother's Day this past weekend. Can you share how that's uh, affected uh, your business, your leadership and you know the thing we all hear about, you know, that uh, almost unattainable balance, how you've sort of worked that in? Mm -hmm. So, you know what, I think that's such a great question. I'm gonna, I usually direct it to one person, or I think everyone could have a, an opportunity to answer that, but make it Fast. short and crisp, okay. please. Sure. So, uh, Christina? It, you know, this morning I was at this um, bank event, and the CEO, a male, got up and said, you know, all these studies have shown that the last two years, um, the people that have got us through the pandemic happen to be women. They have been the most resilient and shown they, you know, they're working, they have their kids, they're at home, they're whatever. I found that very interesting to think about it because wouldn't, you know, if a woman's living with a woman, woman living with a man, woman living alone, aren't they, they're both in the um, same house. So what, why are the women singled out as doing the best job? Because there's still someone else in the home. So uh, for me, I, I don't like. I don't think there's any more balance. I just take look at it, it all as more challenges, and I love a challenge. So having kids wasn't like, oh, there's a balance. It's like, ooh, now I have to. How can I be even more efficient with less time? And how can I just do it? That, that's the way. That's the way I I, I look at um, them. But really, it's not. Again, it's not about balance. It's like, ooh, now I understand more what I need to do, um, I can be more clear, I have to be more efficient um, to pass on things to them so that I can uh, ensure they grow up to be their own people and mm -hmm. you know, whether they're sitting here or they're, you know, mm -hmm. well, one of my sons wants to be a pilot, so why do they want to do that? You know, probably yeah. not gonna I, happen, I would but. say the, the balance is not really that yeah. achievable and just setting realistic expectations. And you know, you'll have people say to me, oh, how do you do so much? And I'm like, I probably don't do anything really well. Like I just like, <laughs> I don't really know, but I'm, I'm trying my best. And uh, I just, you know, you do I don't know. I, I have this funny story. I, you know, you, you have women on stage and they're like, oh, we ordered pizza a few nights, you know, a few extra nights a month. And I was like, my credit card was frozen because of Uber Eats. Like, it was so embarrassing. <laughs> the lady at the bank was like, like, you can't order it this much. I'm like, I do, okay, I do. And yes, you know, you miss your kids, whatever, but I have a very supportive partner. And it's like, that's, that's not the balance. It's just, it's just the, the, yeah. the formula, I think, to make it workable. And, um, you know, you saw in the pandemic, the, the the definition of our of our families and our marriage, like it's not sustainable because of what the weight was that women were carrying, and uh, it needs to be revisited. And how we make it work is not really that sustainable. So sorry for the negative perspective. But. <laughs> I'm about to make it positive, but go ahead. Yeah, and, but you know what I will say? I will say I don't have I don't have a daughter to you know say look at me. You know, professional woman. I have three sons, and. I am very confident that they look at me and they're proud of me, and that's what I can do. Set that next generation, you know, build their awareness that this is what a woman can do. And mm -hmm. sometimes it means I have to have Uber Eats. Um, Anna Maria, I, do you, would you like to add to that yes, before I bring it I have it to a close? lot to add, but I'll yes. keep it brief. Um, balance does not exist in my world. <laughs> so when I need to work really hard, I work really hard. And when I don't, I try to spend as much time with my kids as possible. It's, it's really, it's a weight, it's a scale, and it tips constantly. Um, so I think that when Anne-Marie Slaughter wrote that article, Why Women Can't Have It All and Broke the Internet, or the Atlantic Monthly, I thought, finally, we're going to get somebody who's going to talk about why this concept doesn't really exist and it's not attainable. She went on to write a book about care, so I was a bit disappointed, but it was an important topic in the sense that, you know, we should really reevaluate what our expectations are of ourselves. And I'm actually really proud that my kids, my two girls, constantly see me struggle. I mean, they make fun of the fact that I'm barely on time for everything. They, they know that I have a wife at home as a joke mm -hmm. because I have an au pair that lives with us, or I have a nanny, or I have someone that comes in and helps. Because it's impossible to do everything that we need to be doing. And it's... There's, for me, there's no balance. Mm -hmm. It doesn't exist for me. So I wish that, and you know, to your point, I think I do everything kind of 
I in guess. a mediocre way. <laughs> but it, there's, no, there's no other option, yeah. right? Well, we're not going to end this on mediocrity. No, we're not. <laughs> we're not. not a panel of mediocrity. So no. let's be clear. They're just being shy and bashful. So it's a great way for me to conclude the session, unless there's any other questions. So let's just reflect on what we heard today. First and foremost, when you go to your respective jobs or what it is that you do day to day, you've got three key messages from this esteem panel. You can't do it on your own. There's no I. You have to have a team. That team has to be a team that works together. There's lots of teams that can you know, be around the boardroom table and they're you know, shooting bullets at one another. That's not the team that these three women talked about. It's the team that supports one another, encourages one another. And then there's a leadership style that I heard today is that you've got to pause and think about that style. And sometimes you're in front, you're leading, and sometimes you're listening. And you know, it's really fascinating. I don't know if we listen enough. Although Anna Maria says, what is balance? Balance is how you define balance. Because anybody today that feels that they can define that, I think that's an everyday accomplishment. The balance for me is daily. I couldn't think of it beyond the day. But it's, it's, it is what it is. But what I really want you to leave with is, and it's actually now that we have our fathers in the room, and now I'm going to quote my father, and I'm not going to cry. Um, he says, you can be anything you want to be. So I pause on that, everybody. You can be anything you want to be, and never forget that. And that's how I'd like to end the session. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you all so much for being here this evening. Um, I'm repeating, I think, the thought of everyone in the crowd. That was incredible and really inspiring. Um, to close out tonight's program, I'd like to now ask one of our event sponsors, Rukaya Gay, member of Local 27 of the Carpenters Union, to close us out. Rukaya? Good evening, everyone. Bonsoir, tout le monde. C'était vraiment une soirée exceptionnelle. It was really an exceptional evening tonight. I would like to really say thank you to our 2022 panelists, Andrea, Christina, and Anna Maria, and a special thank you to Lauriane for this amazing and frank discussion. I'm just totally in awe for your leadership and everything that you do. Thank you. Um, and also, you gave us a unique insight on modern, um, on a modern industry leadership, and what a different world and economy we are in now, from 80 years to today. Wow, impressive. Um, just wanted to also say thank you to all our sponsors, especially uh, our lead sponsor, the real estate, um, the Baker Real Estate. A heartfelt thank you. I was looking for you. <laughs> Thank you. And also our event sponsors, Architects Alliance, the Mc, uh, McMillan LLP, and my organization, the Carpenters Union. Tonight's event wouldn't be possible without our sponsors and also with, without all of you here tonight and our volunteers. Please be sure to check out our ULI uh, Toronto's upcoming programs. Um, especially next week, as uh, Richard mentioned earlier, uh, we do have the special Ontario pre-election webinar. The city building uh, is on the ballot and it will be held on Thursday, May 19th at 12 p.m. Um, an in-person pre-election event on June 14th will be also announced soon. And stay tuned, uh, two exciting in-person women leadership initiative, WLI events. So we will have the WLI events for um, we'll reset, WLI Reset Symposium with Connecting Cultural Center to City Building on May 31st and the annual WLI Championship Team event on June 8th. With that said, Pour dire tout ceci ce soir, j'aimerais tout d'abord remercier tout un chacun de nous avoir donné cette opportunité et euh, rester prudent et 
continuer à réseauter. With that said, with all the good night, stay safe and, uh, and continue to network. Thank you. Merci. Thank you.